Insider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. We hope you guys had a tremendous weekend, and we are so excited to bring you a sausage-rific episode <laughs> of Movie Talk. Ashley, who's joining me at the table today? Uh, I love that you use that. Also Sausage here, David Riffin. Griffin. Yeah, I was glad to be here. Let me be back. I always like being on a Monday. It's like the prime time mm-hmm. movie talk. Usually on the Friday show, which is a great show too. But it's nice to be on Monday, Monday night. Monday People afternoon. have been craving this show for two days now. Exactly. We finally a lot of anticipation. Their appetite. <laughs> also here, Perry Nemiroff. I'm actually Dennis. You're actually Dennis. <laughs> Couldn't you tell? I can tell. You guys look very similar. I Sorry, so. I, mi- I mixed it up. Dennis or Perry Smirnoff. You can call me whatever you want. <laughs> love it. Love it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, that is, I'll call her Denny and just sell, you know. Can we go to Denny's there. afterwards? We, we're totally going to Denny's afterwards, as Perfect. we usually do here on Monday. Even though you're a pizza princess, according to your shirt, I'm sure Denny's can whip That's us up something day. with marinara and cheese sauce. <laughs> what is our first topic today? Right, it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Some Angry Birds should now be very happy <laughs> as Sony's animated movie Angry Birds took the number one spot at the box office on its first weekend in theaters, pulling in $39 million, down 50 Six percent in its third weekend in release, Captain America Civil War took in $33.1 million for the number two spot, crossing $1 billion worldwide in the process and becoming the 25th film of all time to hit the milestone. Neighbors 2 Sorority Rising took the number three spot with $21.8 million, less than half of the $49 million launch of the original Neighbors two years ago. The other new release, The Nice Guys, pulled in $11.3 million for the number four spot, and at the at number five, The Jungle Book with 11 Seven million. Mark, thoughts on the weekend's box office? Well, congratulations to all you upset birds out there because Angry Birds, number one, a convincing number one, beating out Civil War by over $6 million. And it's something that I expected to have. I actually would have had the box office totally nailed down if I, Neighbors 2 had just performed. Like, I think a lot of people thought it would. It's a really steep cliff when you're talking about it's it, the first movie's opening weekend and then this opening weekend. I think part of that was maybe a sequel fatigue and but more so maybe that the nice guys is going to take away some of that money but the nice guys on its own i think did about what i thought it would it's just a much better movie than just 11 million dollars and i don't know who you blame and in i saw a lot of ads for that movie i just maybe it wasn't advertised in the right way but it seemed like that movie did have at least i watch a lot of espn i watch a lot of sports that movie was on constantly for the last three weeks so that's a little baffling to me as well um perry i'll turn it over to you what surprised you the most about the box office this weekend well quality wise it scares me of course because angry birds is at the top <laughs> meanwhile i can't i didn't see the movie this is just what i've heard from other people so i can't really assess the quality of that one but i actually saw uh the new neighbors movie this weekend and i liked it quite a bit so i'm kind of bummed to see that it didn't do as well as the first one but i it's definitely sequel fatigue there's no doubt in my mind that that's why and with the nice guys i have seen some promotions out there for it but if you're not a hardcore movie fan like we are like all the people that are outside this circle that i know it's not really on anyone's radar in any respect yeah and it's a hard movie i guess maybe to sell because you're not sure if it's a straight uh, comedy or action movie or just ryan gosling and russell crowe bumbling around in the late 70s so neighbors 2 is just it's obviously a clear-cut comedy david angry birds is for the kids and then civil war obviously you know comic book fans definitely want to keep seeing that again is that what the problem with the nice guys was it just there was too much competition this weekend? Well, I think it's always interesting when it's been a while since a kid movie came out. And I mean, kid, I mean, young mm-hmm. kid movie that parents actually take the whole family to see. The parents are going to be out on the weekend. I think that's just attractive because it's family friendly. It's not borderline family friendly. Like maybe Civil War might be a little too dark for some young kids, might be a little too much action, a little too intense. Angry Birds is something you can take everybody to. I think that's why the numbers were better. I think neighbors that, like, I agree with all of you. I'm very surprised about that because the first one was received well. People talked about it. People liked it. People mm-hmm. were excited to see the second one. I'm surprised that it fell bump just about over half yeah. of its opening box office. That's very surprising. But I, I really I enjoyed it. Neighbors too as well. I saw Angry Birds. Am I the only one that saw Angry Birds? I did not see Angry yeah. Birds. I did not table. see Angry Birds. I, I treated I myself. I got out of it. I'll stop short of saying it was a cash grab. <laughs> it was just a, a movie based on an app that's popular, but that clearly was the idea going in. They molded a nice enough story around it. I didn't find it particularly good. I would just say it's kind of middle of the road. It's not as bad as like that squirrel movie that came out a couple 
couple years ago or like the, the nut job ice oh, age movie. the, night the, nu the nut job <laughs> yeah the nut job. but it's also nowhere near like the classic fare you'd get from something like pixar or dreamworks i bet you it would have made even more money if the jungle book still wasn't in play at all like you still kind of have the jungle book and zootopia dangling down there so i don't know maybe that did take away some of its money yeah, was you, it? i'm happy to see jungle book's doing well because i saw oh, it a second yeah. time with my parents in the last couple of weeks yeah. and it was still it actually i liked it more the second time i saw it i'm glad that's doing well isn't it cool that the jungle book is still that movie on the tip of everyone's tongue even with civil war has already mm -hmm. come out which is i love civil war but people still are like the jungle book that thing is a revolutionary cinematic experience isn't it so satisfying when movies that are really great movies they keep going to make money yeah. because people are talking about yeah. them it's really really nice to see and then when you spin it forward to this weekend at the box office man do we have a barn burner of a competition this time because you have alice in wonder or alice through the looking glass which is a known franchise the first mm -hmm. one made over a billion dollars worldwide you have x-men apocalypse we know how the x-men do it in the movie theater and then the week after that you have the ninja turtles coming to town so i don't know what's gonna let you guys see a pretty steep drop off for angry birds <sighs> I mean, I wouldn't say a steep drop off because I don't know if those are going to be direct competition for something like that. I have right. a feeling Alice is going to underperform, but based on uh, X-Men's international box office, that's going to crush it. Yeah. I mean, that's going to blow away past their uh, expectations. I think some were estimating it between 80 and 100. And I think it's expected to go beyond that at this point. Yeah, I feel like Alice, for some reason, and I watch you know, a lot of TV, and I, you know, I have direct TV, so I'm seeing the commercials, and I just don't mm -hmm. feel like they feel like they advertise it too late. I don't know. It just didn't seem like I saw enough advertisement for Alice to the Looking Glass until late. I don't know if that was a marketing tool, but X-Men, I've seen a lot of marketing for it. Angry Birds, of course, Civil War, those films, but for some reason, I just didn't see any Alice at all. Is that, is that worrisome, you think? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that movie's going to underperform as well. I, I'm not ready to call it a Huntsman Winter's yeah. War situation, oh, but yeah. if, I'm, if I'm doing Through the Looking Glass, I just haven't heard a lot of good things about it. I myself got my got my way out of having to see the movie it's so also I how many it. years since the first one a yeah. lot of years and who yeah. if you ask anyone now who had seen that movie back when it first came out and made it all that money like who really cares about it do you know anyone who's like oh i can't wait for more alice that movie was great i don't know a lot of those people to be honest with you ashley you no what <laughs> oh alice is living with <laughs> As, no, um, th basically the most promotion I heard about it was through John Schnepp, and it's basically the opposite of what they wanted to achieve, getting you know people to hear about their movie. I saw Neighbors this past weekend. I thought it was hilarious, and I'm sad it didn't do as well as people hoped at the box office, but I really wanted to see Angry Birds, too. I'm definitely going to see that this probably upcoming week because I thought the trailers were so funny. I guess the very first trailer was pretty funny, and then kind of as the tra more and more trailers came out, you know, kind of, I still, I still want to see it. And I think that, um, the young audience, you know, it's like with ticket sales, parents have to pay for their tickets. They have mm -hmm. to pay for their kids tickets. So there's nothing else really out like that. So I can see why that's at number one. I'm really excited to see it. Well, what I'll, did you I'll, think I'll, of I'll it? I'll tell you this. The, the, the trailers did a great job of selling the movie. I don't think you're going to like a lot of the humor in there. Really? I think you're going to have to wait for sauce. Is it party. more? <laughs> yes, I'm so excited <laughs> to see that. I'm day, so man. excited to see that. Is it more geared towards kids or yeah. is it more? Yeah. Not sausage party. Not sausage party. I can't wait for that one. How many times can, can we say sausage party over the course of the show? Let's do a tally. Know, let's do a tally. You know, They're eating children. Party. Sausage party. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's move on to our next topic, which is not sausage party. Paramount Pictures has released the newest trailer for Star Trek Beyond, the Justin Lin directed third movie in the reboot Star Trek franchise starring Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, Zoe Saldana, Idris Elba, Simon Pegg, Carl Urban, Anton Yelchin, and Sylvia Butella. <clears throat> the sequel from a script by Simon Pegg and Doug Young finds the crew in the midst of their five-year mission when they run across a villainous alien played by Elba. The trailer premiered during a fan event in Los Angeles where it was announced that Star Trek Beyond will also have its world premiere at San Diego Comic-Con on July 20th during the world's very first outdoor IMAX screening with a live orchestra accompany accompanying. Star Trek Beyond opens in theaters on July 22nd. Perry, what do you think of the new trailer for Star Trek Beyond? I thought this trailer was incredible. Only slight change I would make to this trailer is to not have that little joke moment at the end. I think it kind of killed the momentum that they built up, but this thing just builds and builds and builds and you really feel it. And it has it does such a good job of highlighting each character in a way that means something and makes you think, oh, I wonder how so-and-so will fare in this situation. And one of my favorite parts in this is when Zoe Zeldana says they're boarding us something mm -hmm. about the delivery of that line it like just kind of sucks the air out of the room like oh my god they really might not make it through this 
I was nervous for the crew that I've come to know and love, particularly from the last two movies. I was never a big Star Trek fan growing up, but the J.J. Abrams reboot got me hooked, and I, like everybody else, knew that Star Trek hardcore fans were not going to appreciate the Beastie Boys trailer, is what it's come to be known now. This is the trailer for you, because it shows us a lot of action, a lot of really intense outer space stuff. You get some Star Trek Wookiee villains. I thought Idris Elba is a very ominous presence in there. I liked a lot of the action scenes that I saw here. I liked the way the crew reacts. I didn't hate the joke at the end. I get why it might be like, oh, okay, and we still have some jokes in this movie. It felt so out of place to me. It, did. it felt they, a little out of place. They were nailing one thing, and, it's a, and it almost feels like an obligatory thing, you know? Like, you gotta do that at the end of almost every single trailer. Yeah, at this you point. have to have some sort of, like, tag at some, the end. Yeah, some, like a post-title thing. It's a, it's a post credit scene in a two-minute movie. So if you want to see Dennis Zhang and I actually turn on the cameras and react to the trailer this morning. So that should be up by the end of the show on the Quadra Video YouTube channel. David, I'm not sure what your background in Star Trek is. Did you enjoy this particular trailer? I, I, I did enjoy the trailer. And my Star Trek background is huge. Oh, good. No, I'm a big Star, Star Trek fan. Not as much as I am Star Wars, but I grew up when I was uh, in the late 80s, early 90s with my dad watching Star Trek The Next Generation. It's either a very good time to be a Star Trek fan or the worst of times. Uh, it depends on where you fall because JJ created this new, I'll call it a new version of Star Trek, very action oriented, action packed, you know, exciting, intense, maybe something more for the mainstream audience. But I think a lot of the hardcore Star Trek fans miss the old, slower paced, more methodical, more based on exploration, you know, to boldly go uh, where no one has gone before. And I feel like the exploration part of Star Trek has been a little bit lost with these films. So I'm hoping we get to see that because the last trailer we heard, the frontier pushes back. And we know mm -hmm. like they're going out to the frontier now. We're going to see what's out there beyond, you know, what they would consider, I guess, the central part of the galaxy. So I'm curious to see what's going to happen with that. Does this movie or does this trailer get you guys more excited to see the film? Because, I mean, look, look, the first one, I was like, okay, look, it, it feels weird seeing Sabotage in there during the entire trailer. And I don't think mm -hmm. hardcore fans are going to like it. But then I turned on this trailer and I'm like, all of a sudden, now I really want to see this movie. I'm excited for Star Trek Beyond. This trailer made all the difference for me. Me. I mean, I really, I, I care just because it's a big movie that comes out, and I need to be in the know to that extent. But I wasn't that excited for it compared to some of the other stuff that's coming out in the next couple of months. But this trailer completely changed the game, and it's, it's kind of like what we said before with just having you invested in each and every character. Like, at this point, I feel the need to know what happens to them. Right, David, do you know any of the background as far as what Idris Elba, ca the, that character might be, or Sophia Battelle, or any of these new aliens that we might check out? Uh, I, I know the look of them, I just can't remember the name. So yeah, I said my Star Trek off. Sophia so <laughs> Battelle yeah. in this? Oh, she looks so just killer. Just good, yeah. And Idris is just doing it. I mean, he did such a great job as Shere Khan, you know, mm -hmm. on Jungle Book. He's, a, he's gonna be a good villain. He's gonna be a good uh, antagonist. But no, I, I'm excited. The trailer looks good. I'm excited for this. The cast has great chemistry. So you say it, whether you're an old school Star Trek fan or a new school Star Trek fan, this cast has chemistry. They work well together, and they're always fun. They have, you can tell they're having fun shooting these films. They're having a good time. It right. sounds like that fan event from the other night went over really well, too. There were like a lot of positive vibes. Collider had someone there. You can actually go on and read the report from Tommy Cook right now, and he wrote about the three scenes that they screened, and it just seems like they were really kind of nailing the right tone. Like It's all based in you know Captain... You see a little bit of it in the trailer where he's kind of conflicted about why he became Captain to begin with and it seems like a perfect balance of you know fun and celebrating exploration while also staying grounded in the personal issues that he's dealing with so all of that sounds very promising to and me this is the third movie in the reboot so if this movie does well we get a fourth one and obviously that's yeah. going to be the movie where they save the whales so everybody go see star trek that, the voyage yeah. home is a great one that's a great one they're exploring they're helping out the planet seems they got to like find the nuclear vessels yeah, in it's alameda a, it's a yeah. good thing to do <laughs> ladies and gentlemen all right let's go to our next trailer story Disney has released the first sneak peek at their upcoming live-action retelling of Beauty and the Beast, giving audiences a tiny glimpse at the highly anticipated film based on the animated classic. The film stars Emma Watson as Belle and Dan Stevens as the Beast, Luke Evans, Kevin Klein, Josh Gad, Ewan McGregor, Stanley Tucci, Ian McKellen and Emma Thompson also star. Beauty and the Beast is directed by Dream Girls director Bill Condon and opens in U.S. theaters on March 17, 2017. David, what do you think of the short tease for Beauty and the Beast? I, I loved it. I'm, I'm a sucker for anything Disney. Uh, I, I love their, their live action entries, especially Cinderella. I know Maleficent was flawed but I still enjoyed it. You know, I'd love to see more of the exploration of some of the villains come out, but uh, this looks good. I love the music. It's just a tease. 
just small TVs. You know, you see the rows, you hear the music from the original. It just gives you that nostalgia. I saw this when I was a kid, and I really enjoy it. That beast terrified me as a little kid, too. And I just can't wait to see uh, what he's going to look like. We just got the little claw marks there. We didn't get to see the actual beast, so I can't wait to see that, too. But I'm glad they didn't reveal too much. It's a teaser. It's just supposed to kind of just give you a little taste, give you a little taste of what's to come. I think they did a great job with it. Yeah, the claw marks were spectacular, yeah. man. And I'm waiting to see Belle in, like, the yellow dress. Yep. And, like, oh, this is the full-on. This is Emma Watson as Belle. This is what I wanted to see. And now that I think about it, I'm kind of glad they didn't show us that yet. I mean, this was a teaser in the truest sense of the word. You can look at this and say, oh, we got to hear the music. We got to see what the Beast used to look like. We get to see Belle a little bit at the end looking at the rose. Or you can just be like, oh, well, they showed the inside of a really big house, and it looks mm -hmm. like it hasn't been cleaned in some time. It looks like it's fall because there's leaves, and uh, that was the trailer. But we also got to hear some of the voiceovers or some of the characters that we're going to know, like, like Ian McKellen, Ewan McGregor. They just all sound so good. This has always been one of those movies that looks like one of the best casts that we've ever had in one film coming together for a live action Beauty and the Beast. This is what you want out of a teaser trailer, right, Perry? Yeah, well, it, isn't it nice to get a teaser trailer and not just a full-blown trailer that shows you everything? <laughs> and this is the kind of property that's perfect for that format because there's so many things where they can't spoil the movie, but you can just have little things like the rose and certain voices, and you're like, oh, that's Beauty and the Beast. That song, I know it, but, you know, we haven't seen the yellow dress and some other big mm -hmm. iconic set pieces in there. But I'm actually on the opposite side of Maleficent. I did not love that movie, so the fact that this trailer to me says they are sticking with traditional Beauty and the Beast, that means the world to me. Mm. This is the movie that I want. That's a very, very good point. I mean, look, I'm really looking forward to seeing this teaser trailer in a movie theater. When I actually pay like a civilian to go see a movie, and you sit there and you get all the trailers, this is going to surprise people, because not everybody on Earth knows that there's a live-action Beauty and the Beast coming out. So this thing fades in, you see that cast, you see the Disney logo, you're like, what the, what, what is that? Then you see the claw marks, you're like, oh, could this possibly be? By the end of the trailer, you know it's Beauty and the Beast. It was really, really well done in 90 seconds. I am so curious to see what the rest of those characters look like, though. Oh, like, yeah. Even though they're hidden, I am just dying at this point, because that's the big thing. That could make or break this movie, what those animated uh, like dishes and all those things that are not real things like that is going to go one way or the other. I mean, what do you got? You got a teapot, you got a candelabra. Yeah, Lumiere, got... Codsworth is a clock. clock yeah. yeah, yeah, is a clock. And I'm curious to see what Dan Stevens took a really big risk a few years ago. He was on Downton Abbey. He had a good job, left the show to do the guest which was awesome. I don't know if you saw Killer a little movie. Uh, Killer, right? Yeah. The Guest was yeah. one of my favorite movies of that year. So you don't know who Dan Stevens is, go go watch go watch The Guest. Go watch him down in Abbey too. And uh, he took a big risk, left that, had a good, uh, did a great job on that film, and now he's in all his work now. Dan that's Stevens a big risk. is also surprisingly fun in the latest Night at the Museum movie. Really? That movie, not the greatest movie. Dan Stevens is by far the best part of the whole thing. And he is actually, he's hilarious. I, mm -hmm. I would suggest going to see that movie just for him. Night at the Museum 3? Yeah. I literally cried like a baby the last 30 minutes of that movie really? yeah i have my own stuff going on you know robin williams it's like it's, you just watch him it's like oh, right, oh that, yeah. that's i was literally yeah. bawling like it wasn't like the single tear that i had when i saw like han and chewy back the Millennium falcon it was openly weeping to the point when i'm like i might have to excuse myself because other people are going to be looking at they could hear me sniffling <laughs> i've never had that in movie theater happen before and hope to never have it again though ashley i know you're a big beauty and the beast fan do you yeah. think this movie could evoke some tears from your um, inner child probably definitely i wanted more but I guess that's exactly what the teaser's supposed to do I wanted to see more of the like colorful world that we like see in Beauty and the Beast the animated one at least but yeah I wanted more but that's exactly what a teaser's supposed to do and this cast I'm just I'm really again I'm really excited to see how they bring it all together and then when the song came on dun, 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 <laughs> I was like yes more tale as old as time and one of the things as old as time or at least as long as we've been doing this show is the next segment called buy or sell this this is where Ashley's going to present us with a topic. We'll say whether we buy it or sell it, and then we'll throw some elbows to get our point across. Ashley, mm -hmm. what's up first? After Marvel officially confirmed Kate Blanchett, Jeff Goldblum, Tessa Thompson, and Carl Urban would be joining Chris Hemsworth, Tom Hiddleston, Mark Ruffalo, and Anthony Hopkins in Thor Ragnarok, a new piece of concept art was released featuring a look at what appears to be the character of Hela, played by Blanchett, a powerful villainess who was appointed goddess and ruler of the realms of the dead. 
Thor Ragnarok is rumored to be taking place mostly in space, and with the addition of Hela likely delving heavily into mythological territory with Goldblum's Grandmaster character potentially serving as a bridge to Avengers Infinity War. Production begins this summer with the film slated for a November 3, 2017 release date. Mark Byers saw the new concept art released for Thor Ragnarok. Ah, uh, sure. I'll buy it. Why not? I'll buy it because I don't hate it. I, you know, I, I wouldn't buy it and like frame it and put it at home, but it looks like it's a big thing that we're dealing with here. We get a lot of ships that are floating. We get some sort of weird, you know, creature from the back. I'm not sure what the hell that thing is. I don't know what a lot of the stuff in this picture is. I'll be honest with you. I feel like an idiot now that I'm saying it out loud, but I just, I don't know a lot of what this concept art is. But it looked pretty interesting to me. How about you, David? I'm excited. I'm buying it. I, Thor's my favorite Marvel series. I know it's not the most popular one to say because Thor The Dark World gets a lot of flack, but it's in my top three of all the Marvel films. I just I love science fiction and fantasy combined, so this is right up my alley. The Norse mythology, everything, Thor, Loki. I, I love this world. I can't wait to go back into it with the announcement of Kate Blanchett, Lady Gladriel herself. I'm excited to see her. Do you know more about what's going on in this concept art, or are you just as befuddled as I am? I haven't read a Thor comic in a while. Um, Marvel's doing did a, some shakes up recently, so I mean, I used to read it when Jason Aaron was writing the male version of Thor. There's a female version of Thor right now. I believe the male version is still around, but there's a female version, so I haven't read Thor in a while. Uh, Perry, how about you? Buy yourself. I'm sell. actually with you. This is Thor is one of my favorite characters, and I really I love both solo films. I just mm -hmm. find that character in that world and all the characters around him to be absolutely delightful and a lot of fun. Also, when Thor The Dark World came out, I feel like we were in uh, getting into somewhat like darker, more somber territory, mm -hmm. and something about that just, I, I walked out with a huge smile on my face, which made me partial to Thor now. But in terms of buying or selling this image, I I would actually buy it for the reason that you'd I'd frame say. this, right? I, I would yeah. put this up and frame it. And I actually think that yeah. concept art should be used as promotional material more often, because concept art is normally like so much more gorgeous than anything Thing they could slap on a poster with floating mm -hmm. heads and all that nonsense. I want that. Yeah, but I mean, people are going to come over to your place and then they're going to be like, what the hell? You're going to have to explain to them that it's Thor Ragnarok. That's like, the best thing, though, is when you when you hang things on your wall and people come over and they're like, oh, what's that? I, I love explaining the stuff on my walls. But also, anytime... <laughs> that's Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> that's just Thor Ragnarok. That's Ragnarok. I would yeah. be happy to say that. But <laughs> at this point, I'll buy anything Thor because of Jeff Goldblum. Oh, yeah, yes, great match. That sounds like kick-ass casting. And I feel bad for Chris Hemsworth because his movies outside of the Marvel franchise haven't been doing well. I really, I like Drive. I thought it, he was good in it. That didn't do mm -hmm. well. I, I, I love the ocean. I love the sea. I like to sail, so I like, uh, you know, in the heart of the sea, I thought was... Yeah. Flawed, but oh, I, I still go read that book instead. Okay, read, okay, I read the, the book. book. Okay, so I mean, I hope Chris Hasworth can find success outside of this franchise. I think he has a lot of charisma not just because of his size and his good looks, but I think he has a presence and he is, I think he is a solid actor. So I hope that he, I hope this helps him out. We hope more. he makes it in the movie, though we wouldn't know from this concept art that it's a Thor movie. Well, but luckily, Perry's here to explain it, just <laughs> yeah. why it's being hung over her fireplace. <laughs> um, I want to, before we move on to the next buy or sell, my slightly sunburned, hungover mind forgot to go to when. Wendy Lee for the comments that we got from the main topic. So, Wendy, I want to turn it over to you right now. You and I got to do the trail reaction to Beauty and the Beast, which you guys can catch a little bit later on today. I'm sure a lot of people were buzzing about that and the Star Trek Beyond trailer. What are the kids saying in the chat room? Oh, you do look a little sunburned. I see yeah, it. I see yeah it, it was a lot worse. Yes, I played basketball for like three hours yesterday. Wow, good for forgot. you. All right, uh, before we get into <laughs> what the chat room is saying, I'd just like to say uh, Chris Morris says, why am I here this early? They'll just be late 15 minutes again anyway. Sorry, Chris, we weren't late today. <laughs> <laughs> just calling you out there. Not on my I watch. Like it. Um, all right. <laughs> Star Trek Beyond trailer. A lot of the chat is liking this new trailer, saying it's much better than the first one. Others are saying that it didn't do much for them. August Gilliam says, I got to say this Star Trek trailer was much stronger than the last. Hopefully, this will be a rare, strong threequel. For the Beauty and the Beast trailer, some are buying because it reminds them of the original animation, and some are selling because it showed nothing. And the one thing that the chat can agree on is this is definitely a definition of a teaser trailer. Mike Cat says, boring tease. One money shot was the Rose and Belle, and Smithian Kingdom says, when you hear the piano music, it's so nostalgic. Oh, man, we are too spoiled in today's society <laughs> when, like, it's called a teaser trailer because they told you they're going to tease you. Like, they literally said this trailer is a teaser. 
teaser, so they're not going to give away anything. Do I want to see her in the yellow dress? Yes, I've been a huge Emma Watson fan since it was a little creepy to be so, and now I want to see what I want to see the entire movie. But it's a teaser, so let's all take a breath. The movie comes out in March of next year. There's plenty of time to check out the full trailer and then the movie for Beauty and the Beast. Right now, it's teaser trailers Rose. are great, but you yeah. know what sucks? Trailer teasers. Those drive me nuts. Where like they say a trailer's coming out on this day, and then they gotta lead up to it with like, oh, five seconds here, five seconds there. See, I like the that Jason Bourne one, where it's just like a picture of Matt Damon, he punches a dude, then it's like Bourne, hang out on the internet, we'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> like I thought that was kind of cool, but I, I don't know. Yeah, sometimes they do get annoying. But okay, Ashley, let's get back okay. into buy or sell <clears throat> with some B versus S talk. Since Batman vs Superman: Dawn of Justice proved to be a disappointment for Warner Brothers Pictures by not pulling in as much at the box office as they hoped, the studio is really banking on the success of Suicide Squad to help turn things around, and it looks as though Warner Brothers is on the right track with some early reactions hitting the web following a test screening. Some of the more positive tweets come out for the, coming out of the screening were at Glean Moo Walker saying, I recommend everyone go see Suicide Squad in August. It is a pleaser. You will be surprised. At Starkiller Ultra saying, Saw Suicide Squad today. It met my expectations. Can't wait for the actual release. And the most positive comes from at Arjun from TO saying, Just got out of a test screening for Suicide Squad. This is the movie that should have launched the DCEU. Perfection, filmmaking, breathtaking. Perry, do you buy or sell the positive buzz coming from the early Suicide Squad screening? I mean, how can I not buy this? This is one of my most anticipated movies of the year, so the fact that I'm hearing anything positive about it makes me absolutely thrilled. I can't wait for this thing. I want it to be everything I hope for. I want it to be everything that the trailer presents it as. One thing that is probably worth noting at this point is if these people are seeing test screenings, it mm. means that their reaction is being taken into account to further shape the movie until we get to that August release. So, you know, what they see might not be what we wind up seeing. Yeah, sure, I'll buy it. It's not, it's not a huge buy for me, but it's like, yeah, this is this is good early word of mouth, which is something that the DC Universe could really utilize, is mm -hmm. that, hey, people are already buzzing about this movie that's not coming out for a couple months. You're right, Perry, maybe they continue to shape the movie. Maybe it's totally a done deal and they just have to sit in the can until August. But either way, it's never bad to hear these things, you know? And these are coming, I believe, from just random fans. These are not coming from, like, when we heard that the Warner Brothers executives gave Batman versus Superman a standing ovation months before it came out it's like well great but they work for warner brothers so like how much can i take that into account whether i'll like it or not this gives me a little bit more hope and i already am very excited to see suicide squad david how's this news hit you oh d definitely buying it and i buy it because of david ayer you know end of mm -hmm. watch i, I love fury that was one of my favorite films when it came out so i mean mm -hmm. I, I trust him i trust his vision the whole reshoot thing doesn't really bother me that much because i know we're just going to get a little more batman and that's fine that's all a little more batman i think everybody enjoyed the batman in batman v superman ben affleck's batman so i think that's a good thing also if you're worried about these test screens be like oh it's it's probably made up or this stuff is just you know produced by the studio it's like we're kind of spoiled here in LA. We walk outside here near the AMC movie theaters mm -hmm. and we walk around. There's always, I think they just did Live by Night the other night, you know, with Ben Affleck's new film, which I really want to see. That's gonna, probably going to be a good film. Uh, Dennis and I saw Gravity, I want to say seven months before it even came out in Pasadena. Uh, and it's just the, the special effects weren't even finished. But, you know, we got to react. We weren't supposed to tweet about it, though. I don't know how they, they were allowed I, to do that's that. That's the point I was going to bring up. I'm actually, surprised not they're not, allowed to do this. And and they actually, didn't have to yeah. sign away their life before they saw this thing. And I yeah, think if I you mean, work for press, you're actually not supposed to see them. But. I, I, I just don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't recognize these Twitter handles off the top of my right. head. I don't know if it's three eggs that have, mm -hmm. you know, one follower and it's like, wait, wait, who are you again? Or yeah. if it's like an actual account from a fan. That's what I'm assuming going into it. So if it's not somebody in the press, I don't think anybody in the press would actually no. would actually tweet, would, no. would, would risk losing like their I know every time I, I, I never pass yeah. that Burbank, I right. always look at the titles. I'm like, oh, I want to fill that out. And I never do because mm -hmm. I know down the line I'm going to want to cover it. Yeah. That's right, yeah. We, we could all go in, like, undercover to a Suicide Squad, just, like, wear, like, goofy glasses right. and mustaches. Nobody's going to know. They're going to tweet it out from a dummy account. And hopefully we love it as much as this early word does, too. Yeah. So we'll have to wait until August to check it out. It cannot get here fast enough. Because what else comes out in August? 
Sausage party. Hey, hey. All hey. right. What's our next, <laughs> what's our next topic, guys? In advance of the July release of Star Trek Beyond, it looks as though Paramount is going to try to get itself beyond a serious problem it's having with the passionate fan base of Trekkies. During the Star Trek fan event this past weekend, producer J.J. Abrams announced the studio will be dropping the contentious lawsuit against a fan film production known as Star Trek Axanar, with Abrams quoted as saying the litigation was not the appropriate way to deal with the fans. The plan feature-length fan film funded on Kickstarter picked up 638000 which the studio thought was too high of a level of funding for a fan film and crossed a threshold into infringement. That didn't sit well with Trek fans or longtime fan director Justin Lin. When asked about the status, Abrams said... A few months back, there was a fan movie and this lawsuit that happened between the studio and these fans, and Justin was sort of outraged by this as a longtime fan. We started talking about it and realized this wasn't an appropriate way to deal with the fans. The fans of Star Trek are part of this world. We went to the studio and pushed them to stop this lawsuit. Within a few weeks, it'll be announced that this lawsuit is going away. David Byers sell the comments Abrams made about Star Trek Axanar. I think they're, they're perfect. He said exactly what he needed to say. I mean, these films are a great advertisement for their upcoming film. I mean, look at the new Darth Maul 17-minute uh, movie we had there. I don't know if that was made out in Germany or whatever. That was, made. It was mm-hmm. beautiful. I mean, Lucas was so generous about that. I don't think he ever... I don't know if Dan has any history with lawsuits or anything, but I remember he would allow fans to make fan films. I know this isn't a fan film, but even when Seth MacFarlane did his whole Family Guy run with the Star Wars uh, original trilogy, Seth MacFarlane asked him, like, why did you let, why did you let me do this? And he said, because I, I love Family Guy. I'm a fan. I want the fans to be able to express themselves. This is a great answer by J.J. Abrams. I'm so happy they're going to drop the lawsuit. This is just more any more Star Trek out there is always a good thing, especially if it's made well. Oh, yeah, I, I buy this thing 100%. If you need a positive PR spin, just call J.J. Abrams. Yeah. He's always your man. And- <laughs> And when he delivered this news, it's just it's great to hear because not only is it them letting the fans do what they want to do, regardless of what the dollars and cents of it is, it's also Star Trek, which is a property that could always use more positive buzz and, and to, to to seem like it really is a community of fans as opposed to a bunch of people who like a property and then some big like castle where it's like, oh, no, you can't really do this. I like that it feels more uh, inclusive now that you're allowed to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't infringe upon like you're not stealing anything all right Right. you're just taking a known property and you're making a new story about it and i don't think it's going to be competitive as far as the storyline goes with anything that they're doing in the beyond world or anything beyond that so i think this is an awesome play and the director of that film that was you know, being sued. Uh, Robert Meyer Burnett is, I know he's a frequent guest on John Schnepp's Heroes. I don't know if he's on tomorrow. He probably is. He's usually around the studio. He's a super nice guy. He really cares about Star Trek. He's a monster fan. That's why he wanted to make the movie. So it's such great news to hear that the handcuffs are off and that we can continue on and, and see this movie. I definitely buy this. I mean, to be honest, I don't know anything about the fine print in a situation like this. For all I know, there is some sort of mm-hmm. infringement involved that people just can't do for whatever reason. I mean, the whole thing with uh, with uh, Kickstarter and all those kinds of promotional campaigns, that kind of opens up a new door that we haven't really tested much. So maybe that was a big number. But overall, I think everyone just needs to embrace fans a little more. I mean, not to switch the topic here, but it makes me think of how people are handling Comic-Con right now, where it's saying, mm. oh, I'm going to pull out because my footage is going to get pirated. You know what? Then don't screen footage for fans that would ruin your movie if it got pirated. This whole industry and all these movies that we talk about so often they're all about the fans and these people that have been dedicated all their lives to these properties and I think more studios out there need to respect that more often and part of that is going to happen with fan films that's right it is an interesting question I mean if you're a studio and you're just sitting back and you're like oh no they're making better movies than we are they're they're really appealing to the fan senses but then hire them yeah really that's, yeah. that's, that's what yeah. it should be I mean, yeah. and, and that's why social media and like the advent of YouTube and all these things are great where you mm-hmm. can you know have your friends and fans contribute to a project put it online somewhere get it seen and then maybe one day you get that call and you get called up to the big league so to speak so i think it's a great natural progression for a filmmaker i think it's awesome for fans this is a win-win situation in my book uh let's do one more buy or sell there has been a lot of back and forth when it comes to a new entry in the Friday the 13th franchise. From new writers to new directors to back to the drawing board and everything in between. However, Platinum Dunes co-founder Brad Fuller has just opened up in an interview about the current status of the film, and it looks promising for the diehard fans. Fuller discussed for the 
for the first time, the current writer Fuller discuss first the current writer taking a stab at the project, Aaron Guzikowski, who wrote the 2013 crime mystery film Prisoners. Fuller said of Guzikowski, He's a better writer than we deserve for the franchise. (laughs) Fuller went on to explain that the studio just sent notes back to Guzikowski, and they're now waiting for an updated version of the script, with all signs pointing to a start of production by the end of the year. In regards to a rumor of the movie being a found footage film, Fuller debunked it, saying, I didn't want to do a found footage version of that movie. It didn't feel like the right way to make the movie. Mark, do you buy or sell the Friday the 13th reboot getting off the ground by the end of this year? Ugh, fine, (laughs) fine, fine. I'll buy it. I'll buy it. I don't want to buy it. I don't know if it's going to be good or not. I like that you got the guy from Prisoners to write a treatment for this. I know that it's just one of those known things, like Friday the 13th, you put it on a poster, people are going to go see it opening weekend. Maybe they can make it good. Maybe it's going to suck. I don't know that. I don't know what the quality of this film is going to be. But if you give me, what, seven months from now to have it be, to have the wheels get into motion, I'm going to have to buy that. Because they've been trying to get this thing back off the ground for a year. Like, whether it was the found footage movie or a continuation of the reboot that they had previously, they want to do more Friday the 13th movies. They're just waiting for the best play possible. Whether that's this or not, I don't know. I just think something's going to happen by the end of the year, so that's why I buy it. David? I have to sell. I'm just not the slasher genre of the, in horror. Is just is my least favorite. It just doesn't. I know. I'm not. I'm just a horror. I'm, I'm a weak horror fan. I'm sorry. I, I like the more thriller, psychological. I guess like The Conjuring and It Follows. Those interest me a little bit more than this. Uh, I just don't know what else can they do with this franchise. You know, I just don't. I think they've exhausted their resources on this. But like you said, with the prisoners. You know, if they're brought in Villeneuve there to help him out directing it, then, 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 then I'd probably buy it. But right now, just on the writer alone, I, I can't buy it. How about you, Perry? Are Dude. we going to get a I know, I'm sorry. I just, I'm, I'm not right a big horror fan. You know. um, I buy it because I'm part of the reason that we get all of these remakes, reboots, and sequels. Because if you slap Friday the 13th on something, oh. I'm going to say, I mean, the Scream TV series is a perfect example. I, that is not the TV series based on the movie that I love. But it's Scream, and I'm going to watch it no matter what. So that's the same thing here. So I I buy it in that I want another Friday the 13th movie. I don't necessarily think it's going to shoot at the end of this year, though, because it's been pushed back so many times at this point. We still don't know a director. I think it's slated to come out in 2017, so may- maybe that kind of crunches the timetable a little and forces them to get their stuff together. But I wouldn't be surprised if we heard of a delay. And the only thing about this specific pro- version of the project that has me disappointed is I really wanted David Bruckner to be directing it and he is out of the picture now. Mm. I don't know if you guys saw Southbound. No? no? Oh, go, all right. So Southbound is a horror anthology movie that came out a couple months ago. Just go watch the third segment. That's the one he directed and it's it's one of those anthology type situations where it's like that one is just so, all those segments in that are pretty good, but that one is so above and beyond. So seeing that made me want to see him direct a Friday the 13th film. You know, I wonder when the next Friday the 13th is. Like the next calendar Friday the 13th. We just had one, so it's going to be a little bit before we get another one. I'm telling you, man, they target these things because, well, we got to open a Friday the 13th movie on Friday the 13th. So look at the next few Friday the 13th that are on the calendar. One of those is going to be when this new movie opens. I guarantee you that. They're going to hope for somewhere around Halloween. I think it's January 13th, 2017 is the day they have it slotted in now. That ain't going to (laughs) happen. There's no way that movie's going to come out because even if you just need to run out to the woods, grab a hockey (laughs) mask and camera, (laughs) it's going to take longer than January to... I mean, that's only seven months to have a completed movie. If they had done it found footage, they could get it together just like that. They did it found footage, but luckily they don't want to do that. I think the next Friday the 13th, whatever that next one is, Mm -hmm. that's when you're going to see a new Friday 13th movie in theaters. Will we want to see it? I don't know, but it's probably (laughs) going to happen. All right, let's move on to Mailbag. Before we get to Mailbag, I do want to go back to Wendy because, Wendy, we did some buy or sells. We did the Thor Ragnarok image. We just talked about Friday the 13th. Which of these stories are most people yapping about in the chat room? I would say it's a pretty big reaction for the Suicide Squad early screening reactions. The chat room was pretty divided on this, mainly because of the BVS early screening reactions. So Xavier Aristide says, I'm slightly more excited for Suicide Squad now, while Blood Raw 1180 says, did WB execs give it a standing ovation as well? <laughs> and sympathet- uh, 
Symptomic fiend, sorry, I just messed that up. Never believe the early screening hives. It's almost always overblown, even if the movie is good. And just to point out, for the Friday the 13th reboot, there's a lot of sell, a lot of meh, and a lot of ugh. But what did I just see in the chat room as well? There is sausage a, party. There's a, I did not see any <laughs> sausage party, which is very disappointing. But I did see a lot of fans are writing in that there is a Friday the 13th in October of 2017. Mm, wow. I will guarantee you that we get a Friday the 13th movie in the October Friday the 13th in 2017. So it'll be about a year and what, five or six months down the road. I bet you're going to get a new Friday the 13th movie. Okay, let's go on to Mailbag now. This is the part of the show where Ashley will read off some emails that you guys sent in. If you want to get in on the action, just email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Com. And at the end of the show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. You guys want to tweet us, ask us anything in the world of moods, whatever's in your imagination, get it out there on Twitter in 140 <laughs> characters or less. At Collider Video is where you tweet us, and Ashley will rattle off a few of those. But Ash, what's up first in the mailbox? Brandon P. writes, hey, Collider crew, my question is regarding the concentration of sci-fi fantasy films being released in December. Star Wars Rogue One is scheduled to come out December 16th, followed five days later by Assassin's Creed and Passengers December 21st. So that is three sci-fi fantasy type films being released in less than a week, all with production budgets in excess of 100 million. So my question is, do you think that there will be enough box office to go around for Assassin's Creed and Passengers who will be competing with each other and with Rogue One or will it at least or will at least one of them suffer? My guess would be that Assassin's Creed would Assassin's Creed would be most likely to suffer, losing out to the box office draws of Darth Vader in Rogue One and Jennifer Lawrence, Chris Pratt, sci-fi romance and passengers. Thanks. Uh, it's a great question because it's a very good time if you're a movie fan around Christmas to see Star Wars and a week later you get to see this really intriguing science fiction film Passengers and then Assassin's Creed. I think that Passengers would be the one to suffer though if I'm just looking and eyeballing those three right now because Passengers, while it does have two huge stars in Jennifer mm -hmm. Lawrence and Chris Pratt, it's not a known property, certainly like Star Wars or even like Assassin's Creed, where that trailer, I think, really impressed a lot of people. I think Warcraft, whether Warcraft does great or whether it's okay, it's going to start to turn the tide in video game movies. And by the time we hit December, the marketing campaign for Assassin's Creed and Star Wars have a much easier job in selling their movies than Passengers does. Now, I might see a trailer for Passengers, and I think that concept is awesome. I love the idea of it. Are they going to be able to convey that and get an audience to not only want to see it, but also have them choose that film over Assassin's Creed or over the second week of Star Wars? So if I was doing the box office, I'm going to prognosticate that far in advance. I would say probably the weekend that Assassin's Creed opens, I would still have Rogue One at number one, Assassin's Creed at two, and then Passengers at number three. Perry, how do you see it? I definitely think Rogue One is going to have an effect on everything that comes out the week after and then the week after that. But between Assassin's Creed and Passengers, I think Assassin's Creed is going to be the one that suffers more because even mm. though people are aware of that property, regardless of how Warcraft does, it still comes with the video game adaptation st sure. stigma. And on top of that, it's a, it's going after a different audience because Assassin's Creed is essentially aiming at the same people who are going to see Star Wars and then going to want to see Star Wars again the next week. Whereas Passengers, it's like, for example, my mom. My mom's not going to see Assassin's Creed, but she will see Star Wars and Passengers because I have a feeling that Passengers is going to have a much more dramatic side to it. It's not going to be all action. And that opens the door to a much wider audience. And I I guess Jennifer Lawrence and uh, mm. and Chris Pratt have a, have a lot of pull right now I know a lot of people who will go see it just for them and I think also the footage at CinemaCon played exceptionally well mm -hmm. people walked away from that presentation flipping over passengers it'll be Mystique versus Magneto at the box office that weekend so who do you see taking the crown overall and between passengers and Assassin's Creed David I, I have to go with Perry I think Star Wars is going to rule the day I think <laughs> Assassin's Creed needs very good word of mouth. I'm, I'm scared for it because I love video games so much. I know Christian back there, he's been playing Uncharted 4. I just finished Uncharted 4. I'm talking about a film for that. The Last of Us is one of the greatest video games ever made. It came out in 2013 on PlayStation. That's going to be developed into a film. I want to see a Gears of War. I want to see a Halo. I want to see my favorite video games because I'm so passionate about them made into films. I want Warcraft to do well. I want it to succeed. I want Assassin's Creed to do well. But I agree. I think Assassin's Creed is going to need more word of mouth because of the video game stigma. 
It just the, the, the movies just don't tend to do well at the box office. That's why they've been reluctant to make Halo because Halo is what cost a fortune. It would be a two hundred million dollar film easy. That's lowballing it. So I mean, I, I want to see Assassin's Creed do well, but I have to agree with Perry. I think Star Wars, then Passengers, then Assassin's Creed. Yeah, and, and I don't think that, that Passengers and Assassin's Creed are necessarily cowering with fear because there's a Star Wars movie opening the week before because it's not The Force Awakens. Like, The Force Awakens was mm -hmm. a movie we never thought we were going to get. It was Star Wars hype was at an all-time high. I think Rogue One is going to do exceedingly well, but, like, if Force Awakens was way up here... I think Rogue One, the anticipation is going to be down here. But then you got to remember, Darth Vader is probably. In that I think movie. we need to go like and this, then it just goes, a little bit, yeah. and then Darth Vader brings it You're up a to off. here. <laughs> like when you see Darth Vader on screen in a trailer, or what do you hear breathing, or whatever? It's like, oh my God, Vader's in this movie. That's going to up it enough. Wait until Star Wars Celebration. I think we're going to get a much better sense of how that thing is going to do at the box office. Then. Ooh, I hope so. I, I, really just, sorry, one more I thing. just said yeah. that oh. like I knew something. I know nothing. <laughs> I just anticipate seeing Darth Vader <laughs> at that do you point. Know? I think Assassin's Creed's trippy. It's weird. Even from I played all the the main games, and it, mm -hmm. it's trippy because you're 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 in this thing called the Animus, and the Animus takes you into this world where you can replay as your ancestors, and there's pirates, you know, and uh, it, it's weird. It's a weird concept. It's really tough to grapple. Even I played all the games, and I still don't know if I understand the entire story. It's and confusing. I can tell you right then and there that will cut off a lot of yeah. the wide audience, not necessarily us and the people watching this show, but the people beyond that mm -hmm. that will propel that movie beyond, let's say, passengers. Yeah. So you're saying if you're making a video game movie, maybe you stick to a simpler story where you're just having blocks and they just make lines and they disappear and then we do the whole thing again. You know, it would be a great movie. idea is if they made a Tetris film. That would be a great you idea. You know what? I'll no, talk no, no, about no. Let's do three <laughs> Tetris movies. How about that? There's three of them coming out? There's oh my whole goodness. whole trilogy, ladies my and My day gentlemen. has just been made. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move on out of Tetris realm okay. and back into the mailbag. Mikhail writes, hey, Collider Crew, my question is different than usual. You guys have discussed how Edge of Tomorrow might have been more successful successful at the box office if it was called Live, Die, Repeat or had a better title. Do you think movie titles attract audiences in this internet age where anyone can look up reviews and watch trailers? Who decides the movie title and does it usually take a long time to find it? And also, what is your favorite movie title of all time? For me, it's Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and it's so catchy and it fits the story very well. Thanks and keep up the great work. I love that question because yeah, movie title is still a huge part of the marketing for a film and I'm one of those people where I like the title Idle Edge of Tomorrow, and I don't think if you called that movie Live, Die, Repeat, it would have done any better at the box office. Maybe you'd think it's a cooler title, but the reason why Edge of Tomorrow did do better at the box office is because Tom Cruise had just done Oblivion, and it wasn't received that well, and that movie looked a lot like Oblivion. It was mm -hmm. Tom Cruise in this weird future, and it just... It, it didn't separate itself enough from the trailers. Then obviously you see the movie and you're like, oh, Edge of Tomorrow clearly kicks ass. Um, as far as the best movie titles of all time, I really like the simple ones. I like ones that, I like something like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I love that because it's very intriguing. I want to know more about that. But I like the simplicity, the one word titles, Jaws. I mean, that just tells you everything about that. But Psycho, I love seeing just short, sweet, to the point, and you get everything about the movie. How about you, Perry? I totally am behind that. I think the only reason we talk about Edge of Tomorrow so much is because there was that whole mix-up where the movie comes out and it's Edge of Tomorrow, and then all of a sudden uh, the studio behind it was like, Live, Die, Repeat. So everyone was like, wait, mm -hmm. what is this called? Is that the official title? So I feel like that's the reason that we actually discuss it with that movie particularly. But I'm with you. I'm short and sweet titles. I mean, Pixar nails it. Pixar nails it often. <laughs> I mean, up something like that. I mm -hmm. think that's great. And one that I didn't like at first that eventually grew on me was Ex Machina because I had seen that when it premiered at South By and I can't even begin to tell you how many people pronounce that title a different way. I always just get a kick out of it when no one knows how to say a title and, and so people go around and want to talk about a movie like that but no one will say the title out loud because they're afraid it's wrong. That EM movie, it's really good. It's X, it's X, you guys see X, that? X Machina. X M M M uh, David, what are some of your favorite movie titles of all time? Uh, I love, like you guys, simple one word, Alien. It's about Ooh, an alien. Yeah. Aliens. It's a good one. Multiple aliens. Very simple. That's all you need. I mean, you know, just, I love those names. Also, too, I want to talk about titles. What's interesting is they change in other countries. 
So random thing, this is a techie thing, but uh, you know, I, had a, I have a 3D TV at home and I wanted to see Frozen in 3D on Blu-ray. And for some reason, Disney in the United States lately hasn't been releasing their movies in 3D for some of their animated films. So I had to order it from Amazon.de, Amazon Deutschland, you know, in Germany. And I ordered it and it had this long title. And I was like, that, that's, that, does that translate Frozen? So I plugged it into my Google Translator. It said something like the Ice Queen or the Ice Princess or something like that. I just love how that changes from country. Like with Neighbors, I think in the UK it's called Bad Neighbors. I believe, which is funny because I guess maybe the neighbor's connotation is different in the state. When you hear neighbors, you're like, oh, those neighbors. You know, maybe a it fun changes. fact that I learned, which might actually be the reason that happened, is apparently some movies will switch their title when they go on VOD so that they're higher in the alphabet. So, like, I've heard that people have gone with ABC titles only because it makes them the top of the menu, which, you know, may maybe that's not the most creative mm -hmm. thing to do and it's not, it doesn't serve your title well. But how many times have you scrolled through that VOD menu and not gotten past, like, G? Yeah. I mean, oh, there's, it, there, Spicy Larry is, uh, it, I think, it, I can't remember <laughs> what the movie was. Finstock, one of our, our, our regulars on, on the Schmoes No Live show, he. He was saying that Spicy Larry is like the Chinese adaptation. I think it was Hot Pursuit or some other movie that was being released there, and they changed it to Spicy Larry. I can't remember what the what? movie was, but I talked about a movie talk a long time ago. Um, before we move on to Twitter <laughs> questions, do you guys have any movie titles that you think are just horrible? Are just like, like, like the worst movie titles? I'm going to read it from my computer because I can never say it right off the top of my head. Okay. Legend of the Guardians, The Owls of Gahul. That's Dro it. Drove me nuts Aww. when that movie came out. Drove me nuts, one, because I can never say it off the top of my head. And when you write instead of just speaking, that title is so terrible to write out. And it also, it just doesn't fit anywhere, you know? When you're making a URL, that's the last thing. <laughs> like with the little apostrophe, do you want to write that out or do you want to put a little dash in there? But I did like that movie a lot. So I just, I refer to it as the Owl movie. I know that the Owls yeah. are from Gahul. <laughs> I don't know where in the title the Owls and Gahul fit together. You could have just called it the Owls of Gahul, but they wanted to go big with it. I know, this is what... <laughs> So I got it with Perry. Uh, uh, titles, um, I know I have TV talk later, so I have TV in my head. I think of Marvel, though. Marvel, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's tough to write out because you have to do S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> S, period, H, period. To write that out when you're doing an article, it's just really annoying. Sorry, it's really annoying. I know this is film mode. It's TV, um, TV talk. My <laughs> worst uh, film title of all time, it's, it's Three Ninjas. You're, <gasps> you're just lazy. I love that it's, movie. Oh, oh, what, because it's three of them and they're ninja? We're just going to call the movie Three Ninjas? Give me That's a, my childhood. Give Come me on. Something out. Three Ninjas. It's such a stupid title. It's like, oh, there's three. Of, if there were six of them, we would have called it Six Ninjas. It's just however many ninjas are in the movie, that's what we're going to make the title of the movie. It's just so lazy. Then you watch the movie and you can kind of get why. Would you rather have Surf Ninjas? Was that... Wasn't that like the uh, the third in the series or something? No, no, no. Surf Ninjas was a totally Perry Surf Ninjas was Clearly a totally I'm different not, franchise. I'm not with the franchise. Than three Ninjas. Is three, it really? It was Three Ninjas, and then Three Ninjas went to like Magic Mountain or some or, or High Showdown at High. They, oh, they went to an amusement park. Showdown and they, at like High Noon or yeah. so, something like that. They, they, they kicked some ass at Bush Gardens. Uh, I, and they I made only a movie care about, about the original. Oh my God! What a stupid title. Okay, Ashley. <laughs> let's move on. Thankfully, to Twitter questions. What is everybody tweeting about at us today? All right, Joe. Joseph Meldrum asks, um, is the Beauty and the Beast teaser released too early? How does Disney keep the buzz going for a whole year? Oh, don't worry. It's a live action Beauty and the Beast movie. Everybody saw that cartoon when you were a kid. You, it just, It's in your heart. It's in your soul, for most people anyway. So now as they gradually roll out what the live action movie is going to look like, this is the time to do a teaser. Now the movie comes out March 17th in 2017. So it's a year away. I know 2017 sounds like it's like way off in the future, but it's not. It's like mm -hmm. next year, dude. So we have less than a year for this. And that's generally the time with a bigger movie, something like a huge Disney release, you're going to see the first footage of it. So I imagine you would get a full trailer sometime in maybe early fall for Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. Is that your yeah. guys' timeline? Yeah, I think so. Sounds about right. And just think about how many Disney movies are coming out between now and then. They're going to want, you know, a slow rollout with enough stuff to attach to each of their big releases. But think about the opposite, like starting early and then having a slow roll <clears throat> rollout of material leading up to the release versus, let's say, trailer, trailer, trailer. Because, like, how many times have we complained about getting too much promotional right. material mm -hmm. for one movie at once? Yeah. I think this trailer did what it was supposed to do. It captured the nostalgia 
And Disney, I think, has learned outside of John Carter, which was not great uh, marketing for that film, which I actually enjoyed. Uh, I think this not the, a great title, though. Not a great title, yeah. not great posters, but I think they did a good job with this one. The caption nostalgia is going to make you want any more, but you have to wait a little bit, and that's fine. It's a good thing. That's right. Tale as old as time. We can wait another yeah. eight months. All right. All right. What's up next, Ash? Janine LC writes, My friend Metal Joshi just asked me, What is the best movie with a small cast that takes place in a single space? Uh, well, I would Ex Machina. Go with Ex Machina is a really good one. It's a pretty confined space, and a lot of really awesome science fiction, Twilight Zoney stuff happens. I'm gonna take your little uh, tech bubble place, that mm. little office, and I'm gonna shrink it into what I believe is a BMW, and Tom Hardy Ooh. driving the entire time in a movie called Locke. If you've not checked out Locke, make sure you guys watch it. If you're a Tom Hardy fan, if, not, if you don't like Tom Hardy, this might sell you on Tom Hardy. He's so great in this role where the whole premise of the movie is the dude gets in a car, he's driving from his job site to some other location, and we find out where he's driving through the course of the movie through conversations he has on the phone in the car. So you get to hear everything. I think there's a couple different camera angles, but it really is, it's a one-man show and a pretty sweet commercial for BMWs. Can I tell a quick little story about that? Please I do. saw that at uh, AMC here, and it was funny. Uh, I was sitting, there's like maybe 10 people in the audience, small audience. I love the film, by the way. A couple behind me, I could hear them eating their popcorn, you know, drinking their sodas, whatever. And about 15 minutes in, the guy was like, I thought this was going to be an action movie. <laughs> and they get up and leave. <laughs> I'm like, where did you, where, I mean, is it because, like, he's driving? Like, you think it was going to be, like, an action movie where he's driving, like, Fast and the Furious? Like, where did you get the idea it was going to be? And he's like, I thought it was going to be an action movie. And just walks out. And it's funny, because that <laughs> movie left. is more suspenseful than the large majority of action movies. Yeah, like, it's so good. Pieces. It really is. He's it's just so watching good. Locke, like, where's Vin Diesel? Oh, yeah, like, yeah he, he was upset. Oh, and, uh, so, sorry, mine, uh, 12 Angry Men. Oh, not 1957, 12 Angry Men. Yeah. And another one that's not as highly rated, Phone Booth with Colin Farrell. Okay. I like Phone Booth with Colin Phone Farrell. Kiefer Sutherland thought it was fun. Good B movie. One of those you can watch like, on a Friday night and you know just forget about it. You remember that movie Man on a Ledge? Is that what it was called? Where like they have to talk oh, the dude off yeah. the ledge. And I, Joel Edgerton's <laughs> in, Elizabeth Banks is in it. So it's, it's kind of a cool movie set in a single location. You don't need huge problems. Hell, Friday the 13th. Just, you're in the woods, you're camping, and There's it so doesn't movies. go well for the campers. Buried's a great one, too, with Ryan Reynolds, <sighs> and that movie is shot so incredibly well. The whole thing takes place in a coffin, yet you never feel like he uses the same camera angle twice. That's great. That you know, it. I used the car, then David upped the ante with the phone booth, and then you made it <laughs> tiniest and most claustrophobic <laughs> of all with a coffin. Ashley, can you think of any smaller space we could the, possibly make a movie? This question just made room come to my mind, but I know mm. it's not one single space because you do I, I don't want to give too much away it's but in the trailer yeah. yeah but um i thought that movie was great and for the most part you're in one space i think mm -hmm. right which room would you rather live in the room from room or old boy Oof. that's yeah. awful <laughs> that's a terrible question Mike, you get a tv it, you know yeah but room's better because at least like you have a companion yeah oh I, that's, that's a good point. Like he was alone well you have a son i mean I don't know. I don't really want to hang out with people. I just want to watch TV and do sit-ups and then go back to bed and get ready to kick some ass. Oh, uh, Moon. Years. Moon. Ooh, that's a great Moon. one also. Moon's really good. There we go. Uh, There's a lot of good movies Moon. in confined spaces. Well done, Twitter. What's our next one? <laughs> Ryan Wilk asks, how do you become an extra in a movie? How do you become an extra in a movie? Uh, the, you could probably Google it and get a better answer than I can. I know that when you when you move out to Hollywood, one of the things that everybody tells you you got to do if you want to be an actor is you go to Central Casting mm -hmm. and they will outfit you with different places where you can show up and be an extra. Now, what does that entail? You basically go on set, you hang out all day with the rest of the extras. It's a lot like if you're on the Titanic. You don't get to go in the green room and hang out with Billy Zane. You're down it, w w with Leo in the you know in, in the trenches, but you do get what is called a SAG voucher. And if you get enough SAG vouchers, then you can apply for membership to be actually in the Screen Actors Guild, which might help you in your acting career if you want to continue down that path. David, have you ever been an extra in a movie? I've never been an extra, but I have another good story. Um, so uh, Michael Medina, who does the Arrow After Show here mm -hmm. at Collider, he was uh, on the set of Inception. He was in the scene where Leo first meets up with Tom Hardy. I don't know where they are. They're talking about it's like a really hot, sweaty bar somewhere They're having a conversation. And when he got to set, it said Green Arrow this way. Now, when you show up, you have no idea what the film is. They have all these code names for the movie. So he was really excited. He's like, oh, they're shooting a Green Arrow film. He thought he was going to be in Green Arrow. And then he sees Leo and Christopher Nolan and Tom Hardy. He's like, wait, what is this? And he finds out that it's going to be Inception. So I think there's a lot of cool stories for being an extra. But they're long days, too. You work long, long hours. You do. Yeah, I you was an extra once. Glamorous. I was an extra on uh, 
warm bodies because it was part of the set visit and they brought us there and they dressed us up in full zombie outfit oh, and like nice. you guys see how I dress I dress in like my t-shirts and my sneakers and my jeans <laughs> they made me like slutty business zombie and I was in like the <laughs> shortest skirt ever and high high heels for 12 hours walking around that airport I want I literally wanted to drop dead at the end of that day it was a wonderful set visit but I was exhausted it's hilarious because I thought you were gonna be like they treated us so well because we're doing a set visit. <laughs> just, I am so excited about the hashtag slutty business zombie. You have no idea. Ash, have you ever been A, a slutty yes, business zombie or of B, course. I mean, an extra? I do that every day, but um, <laughs> there is nothing more miserable than being an extra. You guys are making it sound so much nicer than it is. They treat you terribly and you're, you're just standing there and they make you be quiet and the stars can like talk all they want and they're like, extras, be quiet and you're working for like terrible money. Never do it. Yeah, just, <laughs> it, just if you're going to be an extra, don't suck. Just don't look at the camera. That's Wait, all I ask. I want to backtrack on that a little bit. One good thing for people who want to be extras to do is if you want to support budding filmmakers, go on a website like Extras Access because that's mm. where a lot of film students pull extras mm. from. So if you want to meet filmmakers and get in that way, go sign up for that and then just be part of a student film because, you know, student films are hard to make and it's really hard to find reliable extras so you know you get to go yeah you got to stand around but you meet really great creative people that want to meet other people and make movies together and bring your own food bring a few cliff bars because that craft services table it ain't for you <laughs> Ashley let's do one more quick Twitter question okay Marcus London writes what are your favorite movie speeches uh, favorite movie speeches um, the one at the beginning of Patton when he walks up and he's just got the American flag in the background he just get George E. Scott just like he basically just walks up does five minutes grabs an Oscar and then leaves like he, he's that good in that movie and it just totally locks you into who General Patton was how about you Perry Independence Day Bill Pullman yeah. hands down I am a big Independence Day fan I, I could watch that movie over and over again that is a special one that I've watched and rewatched all throughout my childhood and same with Mighty Ducks Emilio Estevez in the in the locker room Oh, yeah. Ducks fly together. Oh, very good. Right. I mean, locker room speeches. I mean, Pacino in any given Sunday. The inches mm. we need are all around us, David. How about you? Uh, it's, a, it's a very subtle speech. I don't know if you even call it a speech. It's uh, Marlon Brando on The Godfather when he's talking um, about family. And he's asking these one of his guys, he's like, you know, do you have a family? Do you love your family? Because a real man doesn't spend time with his family. He can never be called a real man. And right there at the very beginning of the film, that sets up who he is. Everything he does in his life, everything he's tried to accomplish to build is all for his family. And that uh, just tells you everything about the character in a very short and subtle way. And obviously, Will Ferrell, when he blacks out in old school, <laughs> is pretty sweet as well. Uh, that is all the time we have for Movie Talk. Thank you guys for spending your entire hour with us. I want to thank everybody behind the cameras as well as joining me on the panel today was first up, Mr. David. David Griffin, where can everybody find you, buddy? Uh, you're going to find me later on today, right here on TV Talk, right here at Clatter Video, with uh, Sinead DeFries, uh, Josh McCuga, and Sasha Pearl Raver. Let's talk about today. we got a uh, new Preacher, Game of Thrones, of course, some exciting uh, new things to talk about today. And he might be helping me out on the Schmoes No Game of Thrones review. Yeah, week. doing that, too. Love Thanks in advance, buddy. Perry, how about you? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. Maybe I will share a slutty zombie pick for you. That's <laughs> really love. awkward. And then also catch me on Best of the Week every Saturday right here on Collider Video. It's not just a slutty zombie. It's a slutty business zombie like you you were a I just person. made I made it even worse didn't you, I yeah, I think you didn't help your cause at all but now when it's a slutty business zombie, you're gonna be like oh she was a person of import before she got bitten by a zombie Ashley Boba where can everybody find you, you dress like that tomorrow please I beg of you you guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram Ashley Boba happy Monday guys happy Monday guys and thank you for joining us make sure you guys check out amctheaters.com that's where you want to go for all the latest box office and showtime information bookmark collider com on the interwebs right now that's where we go for a lot of our hot scoops that we bring you guys each and every day and of course subscribe right here to collider video on youtube as well as my movie show with christian schmoes no i'm at mark ellis live and we'll see you guys tomorrow hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider